Okay, so the recording has started. Um, the plan for today is um, to um, discuss now um, that you have, let's say, a good coverage of evasion attacks. We will start the discussing the defenses against them. <clears throat> and then uh, um, this, I think, roughly will take uh, the first hour. Then I will introduce uh, poisoning attacks. And uh, um, then uh, um, I will leave the, the stage to my colleague Catherine Grosse for discussing defenses against uh, poisoning attacks. So that's uh, the plan for, uh, for today. Uh, let me share screen share, start screen sharing. What is that? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, you should be able to, to see it. Um, so before, let's say, actually starting into the details of uh, the kind of defenses that you can implement um, by manipulating, let's say, the learning algorithm or the data, uh, it's good to remember that there are also um, mainly two um, times in which uh, you can defend against attacks in general. So this is, uh, uh, let's say, something general for security. Um, in fact, here we categorized um, defenses um, by, by uh, dividing them into reactive ones and proactive ones. Now, reactive means that um, you react to an attack that has already occurred. So once uh, you experience the attack, um, maybe an attacker evades your system, then you go and try to understand wh uh, what happened. And this is something that you do uh, in a reactive manner. So after the attack occurred, you try to uh, implement some uh, defenses against it uh, to prevent it in the future. Uh, now, these kind of defenses are, let's say, uh, more heuristic in a sense. And uh, this is, of course, the timely detection of attacks uh, after they occur. So if you spot that you have been attacked like two months ago, that's probably too late already. Um, in, in cybersecurity in, in typical applications. Frequent retraining is again another kind of reactive defense because uh, you assume that you know the attacks already and then they are in your training set. You add them to your training set and then you retrain the classifier. And also decision verification is something that you do always a posteriori, mean, meaning that you check uh, whether the output of your system are consistent on specific samples or not. So this is something you do mostly after an attack occurred to prevent it in the future. Whereas proactive defenses are something uh, which is a bit different in the sense that um, you try to build a model of the attacks before they actually happen, and you try to put defenses in place to prevent them before they actually occur. So in, in thinking proactively, means um, trying to be one step ahead of the attacker. And here, of course, we have to know that there are uh, things. So here, there is a, a, a very nice sentence about Donald Rumsfeld, if, he, if you have ever heard it, which is about uh, known, about the category of threats that one may have in general. One is known knowns, which is threats that you know uh, that that happened, and this is uh, what concerns mostly reactive defenses. So you you fight against attacks that you already know and you already saw in the past. Then there are known unknowns, which are things you don't know but you can model. Okay, and this is all the sort of attacks <clears throat> that we can envision and try to anticipate. And then there are even unknown unknowns. So those are attacks that you are not aware of, but you cannot even imagine or model. Okay, so in, in any case, you have to sort of um, be aware of these um, kind of threats uh, to do the best the, the best that, that, that you can actually to defend the system. Also, depending on the resources that you have, of course, and on the associated risk uh, to each of these threats. Then we will see mostly, uh, we will be discussing mostly these proactive defenses that work on the learning algorithm, but you should not um, only think that uh, to defend adversarial attacks, you may, you know, work only at the algorithmic level, because in general, AI components or machine learning components are just one building block of a larger system. So from the engineering perspective, you may also work uh, with different solutions. Uh, I mean, at the system level, rather than insisting in, you know, improving the security of just uh, a single building block. 
And there are, of course, even here um, in this proactive uh, phase, you, you can split defenses by security, uh, those that aim to implement security by design, which mean, um, means that they are robust against white box attacks. So you build a defense in a way that um, you are aware of the worst case attack and you try to mitigate or prevent it. So that's how you build security by design. Security by obscurity has a different paradigm, which is I try to protect my system by uh, deceiving the attacker or, or hiding some of the details of my system. And here you have some example, uh, information hiding, randomization, and other defenses. For, for instance, again, here you can have defenses which are more sophisticated and work in, for instance, randomizing the output of your classifier, or you may have defenses which are uh, trivial in a sense, because for instance, the good rules of thumb could be that you collect training data at different times in different locations, and all these kind of countermeasures also work, because in this case, it's more difficult for the attacker to get to know uh, how your training data is built, right? If you differentiate the collection and, uh, and the timing uh, when, you, when you collect data. So this, this is just to give you uh, a rough overview of, what's, um, of what can be done in general to protect uh, a machine learning model or a system if you want. Uh, but now uh, we will delve more into the details of these security by design defenses. Okay, so we will mostly talk about methods uh, which you can use to improve robustness of learning algorithm and to detect attacks. Okay, so, but I, I would like to give you uh, before um, a more general overview of what can be done because this is not the only things you can do. Okay, um, of course, if you place yourself in this, uh, um, let's say, research field, so trying to uh, craft attacks and defenses for machine learning algorithms, you will discover soon that this is a very challenging problem. And now uh, there is this website uh, maintained by Nicolas Carlini from Google Brain, where it just automatically counts how many new papers on adversarial examples are uh, published every year on archive. And you see that the trend is really uh, roughly exponential in this case. So this year, 2022, we have uh, already observed something around 4,000 papers published so far. Of course, this is an archive, so it means that they are not all accepted. These are just preprints, so they are not accepted at uh, conferences or journals yet. But um, this is uh, roughly the number of people that is working on this problem. And I can tell you that uh, even if we are still playing with simple attacks, mostly crafted uh, using LP norms constraints, so by you know, um, constraining the attack to fulfill some Euclidean distance or some uh, Manhattan distance, L2 and L1, um, even though we are in the simple cases in which these um, distances are mathematically tractable, still building a robust classifier against these simple attacks is very challenging and it's uh, still an open problem. It's an open problem to have something that works with high accuracy and still remains robust uh, for these simple attacks on, uh, on um, tractable norms. And uh, this is why we have so many papers here. And despite this very huge number of papers, the progress on, on improving robustness against evasion attacks is um, still at its uh, infancy. So it's still very uh, at the very early stages. OK, are there any questions uh, so far on this part? All right, if not, I think, uh, let me check uh, quickly the chart. I think it's fine, okay. All right, so we can uh, now delve more uh, into the details of how to defend against evasion attacks. <clears throat> and as you said before, uh, despite the huge number of papers here, what I've tried to do in these slides is to categorize essentially defenses in, into three main buckets. Uh, the first one is this uh, idea of using robust optimization, which we will discuss in a moment. Um, the other one is to use um, an explicit algorithm for detecting that uh, the system might be under attack. And the third bucket is just a set of defenses that do not work. Okay, And, and for those, uh, we will discuss um, something later. So let's focus 
um, on, on approaches which can be uh, more or less promising, at least from my understanding. And I will give some example of these, um, even though it's not completely representative of uh, what's out there. Uh, it's just, uh, so if you go and search for uh, approaches that implement uh, some robust method for learning, you find, I don't know, maybe hundreds of papers of, or, or roughly a thousand of papers that, that fall into this family. Okay, so there are a plethora of ideas that has been already explored and maybe are not so effective in the end. And the same is for the detection approaches. So there, are, there is again here plenty of papers that attempt, attempt to use this method, but they are not very successful in the end. Okay, so <clears throat> let's have a look before at this idea of robust optimization and then to do some examples on how you can detect or reject samples which are out of the distribution of your training set. All right, so the first approach is, is basically um, a very simple idea. So what we have done so far in the previous lectures uh, was to basically create samples that can evade detection, right? So we built this, uh, we, we discussed a, a couple of um, set of algorithms that create attack samples, evasion samples. Now, the first idea that you can use to, let's say, defend against them is clearly retrain on these samples. So you, you generate your attacks, you add them to the training set, and you retrain your classifier, also using these samples. So this is roughly called adversarial training. So let's say it has been named adversarial training in 2014 or 15 by uh, Young Goodfellow and the others, but it's something that existed long before that time, and I, I, I will show you some references uh, later on. Um, so the, the, the idea is quite simple. And uh, of course, this falls under the umbrella of what is called robust optimization. So the, um, in the classical learning program, if you remember, um, we would like to minimize a loss function. So that the one you see in black here is the traditional problem. So you want to minimize this loss function let's say the probability of making mistakes on the training points with respect to the classifier parameters. <clears throat> so let's say you have these four um, training points. If you want just to minimize the loss function, then you would get something like this linear separator here, assuming that the classifier is linear, for instance. Now, what we do in robust optimization is actually add a constraint on the manipulation of the training points. So what we're saying here is that we can perturb the, each training point, xi, by applying this perturbation delta i, which has to be bounded uh, with this L infinity ball. So this means that you have, uh, we are placing now a box. So this L infinity ball means that you can change every feature by plus or minus epsilon. Okay, so imagine that these are two pixels. So we're looking at the space of pixels, and now you can change uh, the horizontal pixel by plus minus epsilon and the vertical pixel by plus minus epsilon. So this amounts for each image or for each sample to have this box constraint placed around. And now you can move this green point in this um, box and the same you, uh, could, can be done for the others. Now what robust optimization says is that you can actually, um, you, you, will, uh, you will play the role of the attacker inside, so in this inner optimization loop. So you want to shift the points uh, inside these boxes, but in a way that now maximizes the loss. Okay, so this is why it's a min-max problem. And then in this case, this amounts to shift the green point to maximize the loss. So to have it uh, misclassified as red with the maximum confidence for the red class. So what we're going to, to do is um, shift these points in this way. And this is what you get by uh, solving the inner problem. And then the outer problem, again, adjusts the classifier to now correctly classify the new points again. And so in this case, you will get something like this. Okay. Um, of course, here, one has to see if there are this converges to an equilibrium point if there is one, and so, so there are theoretical guarantees that need to, needs to be studied. But for if epsilon is not large enough, typically you can you can solve this problem. Um, and this is essentially what is done in different flavors by generating these attack samples and retraining the classifier using them. 
Okay, so that's uh, what is called adversarial training. The most, um, let's say, popular papers on these are uh, one paper by uh, Young Goodfellow, where they use the FGSM attack. So this is just one iteration. Uh, it's exactly what you see here. So you take one sample, you project it to the corner of the box, because that's an L infinity attack, and you just do one iteration and retrain on that. This was uh, somewhat working, but it's actually um, not very uh, robust in the end because FGSM is a very weak attack. And then what uh, Alexander Madri and other people from this uh, MIT lab did uh, was to use the projected gradient descent attack um, to actually optimize the attacks and then retrain the classifier on them. Okay, so this is uh, adversarial training based on projected gradient descent. And what they've shown is that this is much better than uh, adversarial training based on fast gradient out on the fast gradient sign method. Although it's clearly uh, much more computationally demanding because you have to generate attacks in this inner loop, and this takes a lot of time, uh, especially if you have to run 50 to 100 iterations for each point. And the main effect is what you see here is that basically it's very similar to this picture. But here, having a nonlinear classifier enables, you know, the, the, the boundary to be tilted in this uh, weird manner. And again, you see that now we're not just splitting the points, but we're split, splitting the, the boxes that uh, surround uh, every point. OK, is this clear? Um, this was very interesting because they uh, also provide an online challenge, which is now called the Madrid Challenge where they publish some models trained with this method and on MNIST, on the MNIST uh, and written digits. And uh, one of these models, I think, uh, um, is actually quite robust. So it was very difficult to show that you can evade it by um, using a perturbation which is lower than the one they crafted. Uh, they used that training time, which is, I think, epsilon equal to 0.3 or something like that. OK, so this is just to give you a perspective, but this was uh, already in 2018, which is now already old in a sense. So there are uh, better methods now that can be used. Uh, in particular, there is one uh, fast version of adversarial training, uh, which is published at NeoRips by um, Maxim Andrushenko. And here, um, what they have shown is that you can actually avoid the running PGD for many iterations to generate the attack samples. You can still use FGSM, but you have to sample, um, you have to create essentially uh, many more. First, you expand your training set by um, sampling additional points, and then you just do one iteration of attacks. And this is equivalent to keep the original training set and optimizing each point with a lot of iterations. So this is roughly the main idea in their paper. This, OK, so this is just to give you an idea of uh, how adversarial training works. Um, there, is a, there is also uh, something different you can do if you stay in the space of linear uh, classifiers. In particular, in some, under some uh, conditions, you can uh, solve this inner problem in a closed form. And, and this happens if you assume that the loss is linear around the point. Uh, so if you linearize this loss function, then you can solve this in a closed form. And in this case, uh, what you would get is um, essentially a specific regularization term. Okay, because if you want to delve deeper, this is equivalent. This is really the dual norm, uh, the, the problem uh, according to which you, you find dual norm of vectors is exactly the same. So here you can solve this in closed form and then you get this kind of regularizer which is called a uh, gradient based penalty. And there are a bunch of papers that, uh, that do that. Uh, for linear classifiers, this is basically telling you that you can use a specific regularization on the weights because the gradient of the function with respect to the points for a linear classifier is just W. And um, this is very interesting. Um, so if you read this paper from uh, GMLR 2009, uh, they established this equivalence between robust optimization and regularized um, problems. In particular, for the SVM, they show that the SVM problem is equivalent to a robust problem, um, which essentially tells you that if you have a specific kind of, no of noise, uh, 
uh, of worst case noise in your training uh, on your training points, then the specific kind, the regularizer that you use should exactly match the kind of noise. Because you see, if here I have um, this kind of noise with boxes, then the best, the optimal response would be to have uh, a penalty penalize the L1 norm of the weights, which is a sparse classifier. And in fact, what you see here is a vertical line, which is um, just using the horizontal dimension to split the points. So you are discarding a lot of features in this case. Um, is this clear enough? Or do you get the rough intuition that uh, regularization should match a worst case noise? And then there are cases in which they can be equivalent. I think this is uh, very interesting because uh, it's not the classical interpretation of uh, regularization to prevent overfitting, which is a very generic and abstract notion. But here it's more concretely related to the modification that you can apply to uh, the actual samples that you have. OK, anyway, if you are interested, uh, it's not that trivial to understand it, but you can refer to this paper and to some other papers which are cited here where, where it's explained. And now, if you remember uh, a bit when we talked about the Android case, um, what we did uh, was exploit this idea to improve the security of uh, Drebin, which was this malware classifier, um, essentially using this idea of uh, changing the regularization term here. And uh, for Android, the thing is that you have sparse attacks because we are manipulating one feature at a time. And uh, the optimal response is does this um, penalty on, this, on the weights of, of the classifier, which we call the circus VM. And uh, if you remember, I showed you this green curve, which was the basic classifier. So that's the linear SVM trained on the uh, malware detection problem for Android. So on these uh, static features that are permissions, uh, uh, API calls, and so on and so forth. If you remember, I told you that by manipulating 5 to 15 objects in the APK file, in the Android file, the detection rate could go to zero very easily. Now, uh, if you use, let's say, an ensemble of classifiers, so you train different um, linear classifiers or nonlinear classifiers, and then you average decisions, you get some more robustness because you see the blue curve is a multiple classifier system, and it's slightly better than what you have before. But now if you use the, let's say, the optimal response to this kind of noise, which is uh, basically matching regularization to this a specific kind of attack, you have something which is much more robust. And uh, you see this is the red curves and the yellow curves, um, which can be basically broken if you manipulate only more than 100 objects. And now even this can, can look, you know, can, can, uh, can, can seem uh, fairly complex to understand. The underlying working mechanism is, in, is instead very simple. Uh, so the, the green classifier, yeah, the standard SVM is very vulnerable because it assigns high weight to few features in the end. And so it's, it's enough for the attacker to manipulate those values to have a large change in the score and then evade detection. What, what this normalization does instead is to bound the maximum um, absolute values for the weights such that if, if W is just, you know, plus or minus one, then you can only change the score by one if you change one feature. And then if I need to change uh, the score by 100 to evade detection, then I, I'm uh, the attacker is, um, has to modify 100 values now and not just maybe two or three. So that's the, let's say, underlying uh, practical reason on why this works. All right. Um, are there any questions so far? I guess this is mathematically a bit more complex, but... Uh, is it clear enough? Can you type uh, yes or no? Oh, sorry, I missed a question. Isn't uh, the third image also a possible case of overfitting? Which was the third image you meant uh, here? Oh, I see it before. Uh, this one. Yeah, it's a sort of overfitting if you want, but um, let's say here, 
um, there is also a problem that we are depicting things in a, in a 2D case, right? So if you look in more dimensions, maybe it's it's uh, a bit different. But yeah, it could be overfitting in the sense that we are enforcing the classifier to separate the corners of these boxes. So that's uh, the only way you can achieve it. <clears throat> it means that you need a more complex function to, to split the data. So in that sense, uh, yes. All right, um, so let's move on here. Um, so we have seen that you actually have uh, two ways of um, solving or approximating this min-max problem, which is uh, either sampling new data and generate the attacks, or penalizing the gradient of the, the input gradient. That's how, how it's called this value. This was already known, I mean, um, this was published by Simon Gardner and others, I think in uh, ICML 2019 probably, so this was the preprint version. But if you go back, there is uh, at least other two or three papers. The first one that I have read uh, back in time was this one from 2015, where they already discuss uh, gradient regularization to uh, prevent adversarial attacks, so this kind of penalty here. Um, this was already known back in the 80s or the 90s as uh, um, double backpropagation, okay? but it was used for other reasons, not to prevent, uh, let's say, uh, adversarial attacks. But e eventually, uh, what these techniques achieve is just improving the smoothness of the function here. So again, imagine that this is the output of the classifier for one class. So positive means that you are uh, classified within this class and negative, you're classified as something different. So this is basically your decision boundary. And what happens is that if you have the standard training process, this function may drop quite, easy, quite fast, uh, as you see here. And so uh, starting from X, you easily find the point X prime that can evade detection, which is quite close to the source point. If you apply adversarial training or gradient-based penalty, what happens is that this function becomes smoother, so it decreases more gracefully over space, and then probably the distance to the boundary increases with these techniques. Uh, now, this is probably better depicted here. This is a nice um, visualization from this paper that is uh, cited here. What you see is uh, on the left an undefended model, and on the right, you have a defended model. And so undefended model is just one uh, deep neural network uh, trained on CIFAR-10, which is a data set of uh, images, uh, small ones, but it's something in between uh, MNIST and ImageNet, okay? And just to give you a rough idea. Um, so these uh, visualizations are, are actually extracted from a very high dimensional problem. So if you have uh, I think uh, Cypher 10 is uh, 32 by 32 by 3, so it's roughly a couple of thousand pixels, so that's the number of dimensions that you have. So what you do to visualize these things in two dimensions is um, intersecting this high-dimensional space with a 2D plane, right? So you select two directions, you cut the space, and you project the function on this 2D plane. So this is how they uh, create these visualization plots. Typically, what you do is you select, uh, you pick a point, your sample is at the center of this, those, the, fig, the figure here, then you compute the gradient, and this is going to be the adversarial perturbation. So that, that's gonna give you a direction, right? The other direction is just picked as a random direction, which is orthogonal to this one. So that's how you select the other axis. And then on this plane, you plot the, the loss function or the, let's say, the support for, for the given class. So in, uh, um, in, in vanilla networks, so that the, 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 we're using the standard training process, what you observe is typically that uh, um, if you consider a random direction, as you have on this axis here, then the function is relatively smooth. But if you look at the adversarial perturbation, so the adversarial direction, then the function is very steep. You see how the profile changes here, right? So this drops very quickly, um, eventually ending up in the other class. Now, the defended, if you look at the defended model, 
the effect is exactly the one that I was describing before. So you are still, let's say, robust along random perturbations, random directions, but along the adversarial perturbation, the function is less steep. So it, de it decreases more gracefully, which in the end, in the end amounts to you know, pushing the boundary, the decision boundary farther away from the points. So that's eventually um, what you achieve with this kind of um, um, technique, like so retraining on attacks or using special regularization terms that try to uh, push the boundary farther away from the, from the samples. So this is really like in increasing the input margin, okay? All right. Um, of course, as I said, adversarial training was defined in 2014 or 13, but um, it's something that was uh, existing before in the, in, the, in the field in particular. Retraining on uh, uh, samples perturbed with noise is something that has going on for decades. OK, so it's, it's not something really surprising, but um, it was even proposed in this paper in 2004, which is called adversarial classification by Nilesh Dalvi and others. And this is really the first paper on adversarial uh, machine learning. So I invite you to read this one along with another one, which is called adversarial learning by Daniel Lode. So I think those are the two, let's say, first milestones and seminar papers on this field. And here, uh, this, this, this paper focused on spam filtering. And uh, they were actually studying how to evade spam filters. And they show at the end that you can retrain on attacks to simulate a game between attacker and defender to see what happens. So this was the, really the first attempt in uh, formulating the problem of, of classifying uh, samples in the presence of, a, of an attacker. Then there is another uh, popular one, which is this nightmare at test time, uh, where they again formulate uh, a robust optimization problem and show that you can, uh, considering the MNIST data set, if you, uh, you can create something which is robust to uh, deletion of pixels. So you have white pixels, you set them to zero, but still you can learn something which is robust to the worst case changes. So again, this is a very interesting example of the first formulations of this problem in, a, in the adversarial space. And, and then if you want, there is this uh, um, very, let's say, um, how, how can I say, it? This, is, this is a very good paper in the end. It's, it's called Static Prediction Games for Adversarial Learning Problems by Mikhail Bruckner, uh, Kanzo, and, and Tobias Schaeffer. And this is really an example of um, the formulation of, a game, of, a, of the problem as a game theoretical problem. So now you have two players, the attacker and the defender, which is the classifier, and they studied in this paper under which conditions you have an equilibrium point, uh, in particular, not necessarily in min-max uh, formulations, but also in uh, non-zero-sum games. And then they establish all these conditions that you need to have uh, a single uh, Nash equilibrium point. So, I mean, this is uh, really deep in theory. Uh, so if you want to understand something about um, game theory, you can look at this paper. But even better, you can look at the uh, PhD thesis by Mike, Michael Bruckner, where um, they explain different cases, different formulations that you can have um, also to simulate, a lot, um, in a sense, uncertainty on some of the parameters of the, the function of one of the players and so on and so on and so forth. So I'm, I'm just giving a, a sketch here, but if you want to ask, if you read this and if you want to ask questions, um, just forward them to me because uh, I think this is not, not very accessible and it took me quite a, a bit of time to, to uh, master the details of these papers. But um, if you want, I can, I can help you understand this. All right. So. Um, are there any questions so far? No. Okay, so that was, uh, let's say, a quick overview of adversarial training. Then we will see a bit more um, when we focus on state-of-the-art defenses later. But I just want to give uh, a sketch of this other idea of detecting and rejecting adversarial examples, which is, let's say, the other family of defenses which are promising against uh, adversarial examples. So here I just have this uh, representation to tell you more or less to give you an idea of the problem. So let's say you have two classes. 
uh, red and blue, right? As you see here. And then if you train a, a standard classifier, this will just split the space um, in, for, into two classes. And then the thing here is that for every point in this space, the classifier is obliged to make a decision. So even if I put something very far from the rest of the data here, this is classified as blue, for instance, in this specific case. So now what happens with attacks? Let's say I take the red class and I generate some attacks. Some attacks get more or less closer to the blue points. Some others end up in regions which is, you know, far from everything. And um, this is what is called blind spot evasion, typically. So these adversarial examples tend to occur in regions of the space which are not very densely populated by other points. And, and this, of course, can be a problem. So this basically means that, let's say you have malware samples and legitimate samples, and you want to craft a malware sample to evade detection. This means that you can actually break the system by generating something which does not even resemble the, the legitimate points. But to evade detection, it's enough that you create something which is different enough from the known malware class, which is much easier as a task, much easier as a task. So that's the problem. To prevent this, you may try to uh, design classifiers which are, you know, embedding better the um, points from, from each class. So you try to enclose the classes rather than uh, classifying also open spaces. Uh, and in this case, it means that I only classify as red points which fall, of course, into this region, blue in this other closed region, but then everything that falls outside of these two regions is rejected. So what happens is that the classifier can now say, look, this is something uh, which is anomalous with respect to what I've been trained on. And so uh, I cannot make a, dec a reliable decision on this point. Okay, so this, this is the idea of rejection. So you will have an additional class when you can put the garbage in. You say, okay, this point, I don't know. It's too different from the, what I've seen uh, so far. So I cannot label it. Or maybe in, in a cautious manner, you say, this is uh, a potential adversarial attack. Okay, so that's the, the basic idea. I, I just give an example here of uh, what we did with the iCub robot, if you remember. Uh, we just attack the um, recognition mechanism, and then uh, this is the security evaluation card which is associated to that. So that these two classifiers um, are just um, a linear SVM and a nonlinear SVM with the Gaussian kernel. Uh, without any defense in place. And then you see that starting from 70% accuracy on these 28 class data sets, um, the accuracy drops reasonably as soon as you increase the perturbation size. Here, this is an example of roughly, you see the Euclidean distance is 200 here. So we are roughly in this area of the plot. And this is in fact achieving a misclassification. You see that the perturbation is already visible to some extent here. Um, but I mean, uh, still humans can say, OK, this is uh, a plate, right? Right. Now, the uh, red one is the SVM implementing a basic uh, rejection mechanism. So we are just thresholding the outputs, essentially. So if uh, uh, the sample that the confidence assigned to a given class does not exceed a given threshold, then the sample is rejected. So to classify something within a specific class, we need to have a high confidence. Um, and this is using the, the Gaussian kernel on purpose to achieve this kind of behavior in the in feature space. Because the Gaussian kernel um, has this property that if you move far away from the prototypes, so from the training points or the support vectors, then the score decreases which is exactly the effect that we are looking for in this case. Uh, this is called combat abating probability. But uh, in general, that's the idea. You want to have a confidence which is proportional to the distance from your training points, roughly. And uh, as you see here, uh, of course, this is working for small perturbations. Then it can be um, broken uh, again for higher uh, values of noise. But again, one thing that to look at is the trade-off that you have, because of course, when you have no attack, like here, when you are at zero, essentially 
um, you are rejecting samples which are uh, clean. So you, you are rejecting legit benign data, points that are not manipulated. And this happens just because I'm restricting the, um, the decision region of, of each class. So that's the price to pay to have some robustness uh, against manipulated data. So in this case, there is a clear trade-off between uh, the accuracy on clean data and the robust accuracy. Okay, this is just an example. Um, now I, I, I would like to, to ask a question. So the thing, if you remember, uh, with this mechanism here on this uh, application, we had a neural network as a backbone, let's say feature extractor, and then we just uh, modified the last layer. So the last layer was replaced with a different classifier. So all the rest of the network was fixed, and we just modify and let's say protect the last layer in this case. So here you see that you gain some robustness, but uh, the performance then drops again. So can you imagine why this is happening? So why uh, at some point this performance drops? So remember that what I'm looking is, what I'm doing is implementing more or less this behavior in the feature space. So in the output layer of the network. So can you guess what's happening here? Why this is not working if you increase the perturbation budget? You can write your hypothesis in the chat if you don't want to, to talk. It, it's not easy to understand, but I would like to get uh, some opinions from you. So why do you think it's not robust in the end? Uh, there are well, not not really because um, so there are not a lot of samples outside the boundaries. So you see that uh, we have set this um, initial accuracy to have a, a small drop. So that's actually ten percent. But we tune that. Uh, so there is a threshold that you can tune, and so you can accept more or less rejections in in change of more or less security. So the the number of samples that are outside the boundaries without manipulation is just 10% more than before. So it's not really um, critical for this, uh, for this application, let's say, considering also that you have uh, 28 classes. So no, that's not the point. So the, the thing here is that why can you evade this mechanism? So remember that this is not the input space. It's not a space of pixels, but it's what I look after, I don't know, 10 or 15 layers uh, of a neural net. So this is the representation space. So basically, I, I think it's too, too complicated, but what happens is the following. So imagine that you have, this is the space of pixels, right? Then you have many layers which are stacked on top of one on top of the other, up to the last layer, which is the representation space. And then on top of this, let's say feature space or representation space, you train a separator. Okay, so let's say my, um, target class has been circled here and the other class is around here. Now what happens is that uh, um, the network is basically fooled at the intermediate levels and then it's well depicted here. So if you see this is a dog which is projected from, from the space, from the image space, so the, the space of pixels to the representation space in this point G. Uh, you have a car here in the Im image space, which is projected in the representation space far away from the other point. So this can be separated very easily. But when you craft an adversarial example, essentially the distance that you cover in the image space remains very small, while in the representation space you, you make a large path. So you, you follow a, a very far, a, the, the, the point can be pushed very far away from the source point and very close to the target class. And then when they are almost overlapped in the representation space, of course, there's nothing you can do, let's say, at that level to detect that something weird uh, happened before. Um, is this clear now? So if I'm just looking at the representation space, I will see two points that are basically the same, but they are mapped to two completely uh, to, to, the, to images from different classes. So that's the point. 
So here, as soon as you increase even slightly the perturbation in the input space, then the point is put very close to the target class. And so it's much more difficult to, to split them. And of course, then uh, to um, improve this problem, to, to overcome this problem, uh, we tried to look into more layers. And we did that, we, and then many other authors did uh, very similar things. Uh, so you can actually train, let's say, an anomaly detector in each layer and then try, try to combine them. And um, again, this can also be broken uh, because at some point it's very difficult to detect anomalies uh, as you go closer to the input layer because the data is really uh, not separable yet. So all the points are mixed from different classes. So while this, uh, you know, on the digital space, you can fool this system. In the physical space, so if you want to craft physical attacks, uh, this is more complicated. Here, um, I took uh, the liberty of, of uh, putting this video here, who, uh, which was created by this master student, uh, uh, now, now he graduated already. Uh, so what we worked on was um, on using this detection method, uh, which we call deep neural rejection, to spot physical attacks. Now, why we tested that? Because if you remember, physical attacks are much more complex to be designed because you want them to work for different frames, not just for a single picture. They have to work for, uh, in this case, a frontal, uh, frontal face or a face which is tilted, or you know, if you go far, farther or closer uh, to the uh, camera. And then you will see what happens here. So um, this is essentially a face recognition uh, algorithm which is correctly classifying the, the student. And then we crafted these um, eyeglass frames to impersonate some other user uh, registered into the system. Now, if you don't have any defense mechanism in place, uh, this can bypass detection. If you have the detector in place, uh, then it's very hard because now the attacker is no longer able to create this perturbation in a way that it works for different frames, angles, and position, and also to fool the detector. So I would say that these kind of defenses may not work in the digital space against uh, very strong attackers, but uh, you can do something for the physical space at least. All right, uh, well, time-wise, okay, can continue maybe another couple of minutes. So uh, there are other interesting approaches which can also be exploited to try, you know, preventing uh, um, adversarial examples. In uh, one of our uh, latest works, uh, we uh, collaborated with the University of Siena uh, with uh, Stefano Melacci and Marco Gori, um, and then the PhD student, um, Gabriele Ciravegna. And uh, we, we exploit the idea of uh, um, adding constraints to the learning problem. So constraints that come from domain knowledge. So here's the setup is the following. So you have um, an image classifier, as you, as you see here, which makes prediction on the main classes of the problem. So for, exa for example, um, there was a data set of animals. So you want to distinguish lions, zebras, frogs, and so on and so forth. And uh, the, the, the nice thing of this classifier is that you also have a set of um, additional outputs, which is something, for instance, uh, like the, uh, the property of having stripes or not. So imagine that uh, you are classifying a zebra, you also expect that the zebra has to have stripes. So you want to have both outputs of the classifier um, firing at the same time, right? And now these constraints can be embedded in this, with these uh, logical uh, formulas that you see here. For example, if I'm classifying X as a cat, this implies that also animal should be active as an output. Uh, if I'm classifying something as a motorbike, then it has to be also a vehicle. A vehicle is not an animal, and a cat, uh, I think, yeah, this one is probably wrong because we're missing uh, the end. But here you have, oh no, this is the mutual exclusion. So you, you either want to have a cat or an animal and so on and so forth. But so this is just an example. And um, the nice thing is that you can encode this kind of domain knowledge given by these constraints in terms of a loss function here. 
and then it's something that you can optimize and you can enforce through optimization. Um, now here, the, the other assumption is that you have uh, labeled data and then you have a, a lot of unsupervised uh, training points on which you can anyway try to enforce the constraints. But then if you do this, um, again, you try to achieve you know, a similar effect of uh, restricting the re decision uh, regions. So let's say that you have this. This is the normal space of the outputs. You have animals, cats, vehicles, and motorbikes. And then when you enforce the constraints, what you're trying to do is to design, uh, identify a feasible and an unfeasible space where basically in the unfeasible space you reject decisions. So this is unfeasible in the sense that the constraints are not fulfilled. So even if you have something in this space, for example, this point one, this would be a motorbike misclassified as a cat. But as you see here, this falls uh, into the non-feasible space because it, it violates the constraints. And so even if this is in the cat region, it doesn't fulfill the constraints, so it can be rejected. OK, but this is again to give you a short, um, uh, a short, uh, a short description of an idea that you can also explore um, by trying to add this constraint from the outside. OK, so you can have a list of constraints in many applications that can be maybe encoded into the learning process with this uh, kind of uh, tool. So this is, I think this is very nice because it's um, a good way to, to learn both from data and from uh, domain expert um, knowledge that you can plug in into the learning process, which otherwise would be uh, very complicated. And this is uh, some of the results that we had. Uh, you, you see here that this is uh, basically improving, uh, improving the robust um, accuracy at the expense, of course. Again, you have a trade-off at the beginning. You decrease a bit the accuracy, but you gain robustness. Um, all right, I think uh, we can have uh, maybe, let me check, a 10 minutes break now. I'm happy to take questions if you have. OK, if not, uh, let's uh, make uh, a 10 minutes break and then uh, we restart. So I'm starting back at 10.10, uh, 10, OK? Talk to you soon.
Okay, uh, I think we can uh, start over. Do you have uh, any questions so far, curiosities? I know it's uh, probably uh, too early in the morning to ask, but <laughs> just just wondering if you have any curiosities on this, if it was clear or not. Because it's, uh, it's a bit more, let's say, um, it has a bit more of mathematical content, so maybe it's uh, a bit more complicated to get. But I, wa I wanted just to give the, let's say, um, a bit of a co of coverage on uh, on this area as well. All right, but if, uh, if there are no questions on this, um, I just want to mention um, one, just one example of uh, what is called the certified difference. And in general, what does it mean to have uh, a certificate for um, adversarial robustness or, or robustness of machine learning models. Um, so this is actually, uh, so giving a, a certificate means that you guarantee um, robustness within some bounds. So you have formal guarantee that uh, um, the goal here would be to certify the minimum distance that is required um, to manipulate a sample to evade detection. So in this case, uh, this is not done in an empirical way as we do, for instance, with uh, gradient based attacks, but this is uh, done using uh, uh, tools from formal verification, for example, abstract uh, interpretation or, or things like that, where the idea is essentially to bound this, uh, how the perturbation um, propagates across, across the different layers of a network and have formal guarantees. So let's say, just to give you an example, that the minimum distance um, required to perturb a sample and to evade detection is 10. Okay, let's just assume that this is the true distance to the boundary. Uh, what these methods uh, can do is like certify that uh, in a formal way, uh, this the minimum perturbation might be, uh, I don't know, uh, five or six, but, um, it cannot be 11 or 12, for instance. So in, in a sense, you certify something which is more restrictive, uh, but it's a formal definition. So it's impossible that you find a sample that evades with a distance smaller than the one that is found, for instance, in this case, five or four. Um, but the challenge, of course, is that um, maybe this distance could be higher because the true value is 10. So Given the approximations that you're making, the bounds that you're computing, you certify something which is more restrictive, but you know it's certified, so it's it's guaranteed. Um, so the challenge for these methods is to actually certify something which is closer to the real value, because that's really um, that amounts to defining a better approximation or a better bound to the true quantity. So in most of the cases, all these formal analysis, formal verifications to measure robustness. Um, they somewhat certify very, let's say, small distances, so they are very quite far from the true uh, bounds in a sense. So this is one problem. Uh, the second problem is that they are difficult to scale to larger networks and more complex activation functions uh, other than rectified linear units, just because in this case, it becomes harder to treat mathematically, so harder to derive. It is hard to, to derive bounds, uh, which are meaningful in, in, in those cases. And there is um, um, another issue, um, which is that you only certify this distance for the actual samples that you have. So if you have like a validation set or a test set of 100 points, you can say for these 100 points, I have this minimum distance, for example. But you have no guarantee for the new points that will come later when you put the system into operation. So even though you know these these um, uh, methods are appealing for from the let's say to strengthen the the notion of robustness um, for machine learning algorithms because they are they you have formal guarantees. Uh, they, in, from the practical perspective, they're still not um, very, let's say, effective to, to take all the problem completely. 
So on this space, you can find many, many papers. Again, um, I've just listed some of the, let's say, main authors for this uh, kind of uh, research subfield in the area of uh, adversarial machine learning. So you can refer to work by Martin Vechev, uh, Marta Kiatoska, and Zico Kolter. So those are some of the most prominent authors in this space. And uh, so here the problem, just to be clear, was that you take one uh, trained network and you try to measure robustness. But rather than doing that with an empirical method like the gradient, gradient based attacks, you try to do that with a formal verification approach. So that's the certification process, how they call it. Um, what you can also do is uh, leverage similar approaches for formal verification to do something, or, 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 or the way you develop these certificates, to do something which is a defense that also comes with a guarantee. Okay, and a good example of um, these kind of defenses, which are called certified defenses in this space, is this work by Cohen and, uh, and Coulter, I think. It was published at ICML 2019. And uh, despite the idea is very simple, uh, you can actually certify the property of this defense. Uh, the defense is called randomized smoothing, and it works as follows. So you, when you predict a sample X, what you're going to do is not just consider the prediction of the classifier exactly on X. In this case, it would be a, a blue class. But what you do is you perturb this sample uh, using a, a, run, a Gaussian noise around the point. So I'm going to sample points around X, as you see here. And now the outcome would be this, this set of probabilities. So I just count how many times I predict X as blue, as green, as red, and as yellow. And I establish this um, set of probability outputs. Now, given that these are somewhat averaged uh, on a neighborhood of X, what you can do is actually certify that um, this new classifier, which is made on averaging predictions of the previous one, uh, comes with a certificate on the L2 perturbation. And in particular, uh, this defense is certified for a given radius um, uh, of perturbation around the point, a given L2, uh, so within an L2 ball uh, that has a certain radius. So that's uh, basically how it works. Um, and then, of course, this radius depends on how uh, large the variance of this Gaussian is, basically. But if you're interested, you can have a look. It, this, this one is not difficult to, um, to decrypt uh, from, from uh, let's say, the mathematical perspective. Okay, and it's a simple idea that comes with a certificate. There are others which are more complex. Um, but anyway, this was just, let's say, one slide to tell you about uh, the line of work that also exists on formal verification, certification of uh, adversarial robustness, which is also called provable robustness and the fact that you can also develop defenses that come uh, with certificates. Okay, so you modify the learning algorithm in a way that you can certify it more easily. All right, so that was about, let's say, defenses that are promising, that somewhat work, even though, you know, in practice, uh, evading these classifiers, especially those based on deep neural nets, uh, is, is still re uh, relatively easy. Uh, unfortunately, there... <laughs> Uh, there were many defenses that were published and show, later showed uh, to be ineffective because they conducted flawed evaluations. So basically the robustness evaluations that was performed in the previous papers was wrong. And uh, I think this uh, was already um, discussed by Luca yesterday, but this is a good example of uh, what, what's happening in the field. And what you see here, for instance, is um, these are published at um, top venues. So security and privacy, the Symposium on Security and Privacy is the top leading computer security conference. CCS is, again, a sister conference for, for SMP. So they are very, uh, they, are in the, uh, they are the four uh, best ones in security, computer security. iClear is uh, one of the top three in machine learning, uh, together with ICML and uh, NeurIPS. And as you see, despite these defenses were published on these top venues, 
they were shown to be broken. So there were errors in their evaluations, which are discovered and published uh, afterwards, mostly by N Nicolas Carlini, Anisha Tali, and, and others. And again, uh, this happened back 2016, 2018, and then maybe there you can say, okay, people were not really aware on how to conduct properly gradient-based uh, evaluations or run gradient-based attacks, but then the problem repeated <laughs> uh, years after that. So in 2009, 2012, we had the same problem. And again, uh, Florian Trammer, um, um, Nicolas Carlini and others have shown again this problem uh, with these uh, recently published defenses. So there is, uh, let's say, um, over and over, despite new defenses are published, they again contain the same problems that were already known, but uh, keep, uh, you know, popping up. And the main issue that it, 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 these uh, evaluations have, um, there are a couple actually, but let's say the main one is the problem that they use gradient-based attacks to test the robustness. Then what they do is not really modifying the shape of the decision function. So imagine that you have a decision boundary in the space, and that's always in the same position. What they do is only complicate the uh, classification function in a way that the gradient uh, algorithm is not able to find the path towards the boundary. So, and this is, uh, I think, well depicted here. If you if you look at these plots, so you have. The boundary again is uh, where this line, where this G intersects zero. So when the function is well behaved, you can run gradient descent fairly easily and you find the boundary and you can evade detection. What these defenses um, more or less explicitly do is to make you know, this function much more complex in a way that gradients, um, gradient based attacks may get stuck into local um, optima that do not evade detection. Like here, I'm, I'm stuck in a local minimum, which is not, you know, below zero, so I'm not evading. And this, of course, um, gives a sense for a false sense of security because you evaluate your defense, the attack doesn't work, but then you say, okay, my defense is, is robust. That's the false uh, intuition. So the, the, it's, a, it's a false consequence because what happened here is not, is not that the defense is robust, but is that the attack fails. So that's the problem. And um, essentially what Carlini and the others uh, of, often do is to uh, approximate the defense using a smoother function so that they can find again a meaningful gradient to optimize the attack and then they just break the defense. A simple trick can also be that you train a surrogate learner, which is smoother, and then you just uh, transfer the attack to the target model. So this, again, is a simple check, sanity check that you can do to show that your defense um, that your, is properly evaluated. Um, and again, another point, if you're interested in, uh, in, in doing work in this area, is that when you run the security evaluation curves for attacks which are mostly unconstrained in the modifications, for instance, if you just use the L2 balls or, or any distance, when the radius is large enough, so when your epsilon is very, very large, then your, um, your accuracy has to go to zero. Because ideally, you could take your source image, like a cat, and morph it exactly into a dog. So this has to be classified as a dog. So if you have enough power, um, the robust accuracy has to go to zero. And in many cases, if you run um, gradient-based attacks against obfuscated defenses, then what happens is that the gradient just um, ends up in a local minimum. So even if you increase the perturbation up to um, millions or, you know, 10 to the four, 5 or the, or the 6, then you still are not able to drive the robust accuracy to zero. So this is, again, another sanity check that one uh, should do when evaluating defenses uh, against evasion attacks. Okay, so th th that's more or less uh, it for uh, for defenses. I just want to uh, give you a shot, just a view on the state of the art now. If you're interested, I think this very recent paper is um, doing a very um, clear recap of, uh, of of what the status of uh, the state of the art is now. 
Um, this is published by DeepMind, which is this uh, uh, company in the UK, uh, which was acquired by Google. And where they develop, if you, if you know all these um, algorithms, reinforcement learning algorithms that play with uh, AlphaGo or video games and, you know, surpass uh, human performance on many tasks. So that's the company that develops that. Um, they also work in this space. And uh, what they've done is uh, essentially um, proposing some new defense mechanisms that uh, achieve state-of-the-art performance. Uh, this is just to tell you uh, what the current picture is. So if you go to this uh, robust bench um, website, it's actually a, a benchmark where you can uh, upload your defense and it will be evaluated against the uh, auto attack, which is a set of attacks um, on some data sets, and then you're going to get this um, view of the performance. So here you have robust accuracy, and here you have time. And uh, if you look at across time, so this is like the first uh, Madri model, which I discussed before. I think this is on uh, Cypher 10 uh, again. And uh, what you see is that is the current trend now is to train. So this was, this was just adversarial training, okay? So then you have some modifications, but now if you look at this trend, what you find on top is defenses that are uh, trained on larger networks. So the, the size of the classifier here is much larger in terms of parameters. Plus these networks are trained with additional data, which is uh, uh, using data augmentation techniques like uh, mix up or which is a way of combining images and then also combining the labels. And then you can rotate images, change illumination. So they are trained with this kind of data augmentation techniques, which in incidentally also improve robustness in a sense. And then again, in these specific papers, they are not just using adversarial training, but they are showing that if you change the architecture, if you use some other uh, weight averaging techniques, you can get some more robustness. Okay. Um, but I mean, for the sake of this course, this was just to give you a picture of the field now, which will be probably already outdated uh, one month from now, because this is really making progress at a super, super rapid pace. And then uh, I think if you don't have enough computational power or resources, it's difficult to compete in this space. Uh, uh, so I mean, I mean, in the current uh, times. All right. Then the, this this uh, couple of slides that I have are more, let's say, um, oriented towards a discussion part. Um, so I'd like maybe to spend uh, some more time on these, and then we can uh, move on to poisoning attacks. So if, this is like. As I said, the more, the more, um, uh, the more interactive part. I hope so. In case you have questions here or doubt, or you want to say anything, just um, open the mic, the mic, and speak. So now uh, I just want to point out whether we can consider these adversarial examples a real security threat. Okay, and, and there are some papers where this is discussed. There are some different opinions, but it's something uh, I think we should we should consider a bit. Um, and now, of course, there is uh, the first assumption is that the earliest attacks were just considering changes to the digital images. Okay, now whether this can be considered a security threat has yet to be understood and seen because if you restrict the attacker to only control the digital uh, datum, then it might be. Uh, not so dangerous, right? Unless, I mean, even here, if you have an image which is misclassified, but you need to send it to a web service, then, I mean, even if the prediction is wrong, it's not really causing a lot of problems afterwards. Um, it's different if, if the car is driving and then you can fool it, but you cannot do that in the digital space, right? Uh, so the question is, if these examples properly work in the physical world, now, we, we already discussed some evidence of this. Um, here, there are some more, let's say, historical references to the, to the problem. So here you see that uh, um, the first paper was this one by Kurakin, I think Goodfellow also, and others, um, where they just show that a bunch of examples were working, in a, were, were successfully transferring to the physical world. So they just printed some of these uh, 
uh, dark examples and then they reacquire them and see that they were still effective. OK, we have the example of adversarial glasses uh, by Sharif at all. We already discussed it. We have seen uh, the stop sign which can be man manipulated and so on and so forth. So but the real question is, should we be worried about these examples or not? And uh, there was um, a paper where the author state, no, we should not, uh, because the perturbation is, you, you see, it's sensitive to scale, uh, uh, and then the car will only misclassify the sign from a small range of distances. So this is what, uh, this is what these authors concluded uh, in their 2017 paper. But then we know that you can actually create adversarial examples in a way that they remain robust to changes of scale, distance, and position. For example, this was done, I think, one year after by, again, Anisha Tali uh, from um, uh, the MIT labs. And what they did was this uh, cat. They perturbed this cat to uh, be classified as a, comp as a desktop computer from different angles and perspective. And you see that this is happening here, but the perturbation is clearly visible. So this looks like the case of a desktop computer in a sense. Uh, but you see that this is robust to many different changes in um, um, scale, rotation, and so on. We already uh, saw this one, so I'm going to skip it. Uh, this is again another example of a robust um, attack crafted in the real world, so as a physical example. The stop sign is again, we have seen that it can be robust to different scales uh, and length, but then again, uh, what we can conclude about these uh, examples in the physical world. So for sure, we can say that there are a couple of examples that may work. So we know we can craft some of these, um, let's say, cherry picked examples, and they, they are effective to some extent. But, you know, it's not yet clear if this is uh, really a problem in realistic security settings because there's no actual uh, large scale experiment on this kind of data that can confirm that they are really a threat. We have just uh, demonstrated, you know, cherry picked examples, but not experiment. Um, but these have never been confirmed by a large scale experiment. So this is something, for instance, which uh, at least uh, in my opinion is still an open problem. And then uh, there is, again, um, a lot of discussion on whether, um, you know, the, the, the security model of uh, perturbing images in this way is really um, a threat for security or not. For example, is the fact that uh, this perturbation remain unperceptible a real security threat or not? And is it true that um, attackers are going to use these adversary examples in practice or is still something you know, which is like an academic game, uh, because typically what an attacker does is attacking the um, weakest point, the weakest link in the in the, in the chain of, of, of tools that you have, like in the security chain. So if this is not the machine learning model, the attacker is maybe breaking into your system by compromising some other components. So this is, again, also something that should always be kept in mind when you when you have to monitor a security system where machine learning is just one component um, in the in the full picture. So again, uh, some of these questions have been more or less uh, um, answered. For example, the fact that indistinguishable perturbations are a threat, I think we can now say that they are not. And uh, even if there were contrasting opinions at the beginning, uh, if you look at this paper, by Gilmer, Goodfellows, and others, where they talk about, um, um, let's say, a higher level um, to interpret how this adversary example research is moving. So this is more like a positioning, a position paper than uh, than an actual technical paper. Where in the end, uh, they conclude that um, what is that? Um, at the time of writing that paper, so in 2018, they were unable to find a clear example of a security threat that required indistinguishability, okay? And, and in fact, these are examples that you see here that do not require indistinguishability. Like here, the stop sign, We, as humans, we can definitely see that they are uh, perturbed. Now, the thing is, maybe we 
given that we may not be expert in adversarial learning, we don't know why these stickers are there. And if you go in the US, there is plenty of traffic signs with stickers attached on top and nobody's removing them. So maybe someone is going to put these stickers in a way to fool a self-driving car, but you know, this is yet to be seen. Also because there's no clear incentive for people or for an attacker to go there and, and place uh, stickers on a stop sign, unless, you know, for terror, if, 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 if it is for a terrorist or, or some other goals. Um, this again is another example we have discussed before, in, and it's clearly perturbed in a non-indistinguishable manner. So this is the perturbation here is more than visible. And so these are all examples of attacks that are uh, recognizable and do not require indistinguishability. Um, I mean, this is even clearer if you think that the system has to work in an unsupervised manner. So there's nobody, you know, supervising the decisions that the car makes, like if the traffic sign is correctly recognized or not, even because in many cases, the decision has to be real time or very close to real time. So there's no time for a human to intervene in the process. And so actually the fact that it's indistinguishable, it's not really, um, motivated right it was really surprising at the beginning because even these smaller 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 small perturbations were not visible by humans but still able to uh, break um, the decisions of neural nets but other than that it's not a realistic security threat in the end all right i think this part is uh, finished for me so st we still have uh, i think 20 minutes roughly uh, so I think I'm, I can switch to uh, poisoning attacks. If you have questions or you know curiosities, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can uh, go on with the other part. I think I have uh, uh, something like 15 slides. I guess I can cover that. Um, Okay, do you see the screen? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so now we switch to a different kind of attack. So uh, evasion attacks uh, or adversarial example, examples took a lot of time in the course, but you know, because it's the space where we have the higher with the highest number of pub publications for this um, adversarial uh, machine learning or machine learning security area. Um, so the other attacks are less, um, more or less beaten, uh, more or less beaten as, as a, as a, in the literature, let's say, but still there is a lot of work also in this space. So now here I'm gonna talk about poisoning attacks, which are a completely different setting uh, than adversarial examples, okay? So what we have here is that we are as, an, as attackers, we are uh, trying to compromise the training set or the training process of the algorithm. <clears throat> and there are cases in, this, uh, in which this may happen. Uh, one example that I like uh, very much is this one, where uh, this uh, artist from, uh, from Berlin put um, roughly 100 phones into a cart and uh, he was going around with his cell phones behind him, as you see in the picture. And what happened was that uh, Google Maps uh, told that there was a traffic jam uh, in that street because, you know, Google Maps um, identifies traffic jams by basically monitoring how many cell phones are on the street, um, making the assumption that one cell phone equals one car or, or something like that. So uh, this was very nice because the traffic here uh, was basically diverted on different uh, routes, routes and then uh, Essentially, this street uh, remain uh, uh, empty for uh, one hour or so, I think. So that, that was a really nice experiment. And another example of um, how you can poison the data uh, used by learning algorithms is this one uh, from the um, um, uh, Twitter bot that was um, designed by Microsoft and then uh, shut down after a few, a few hours. And this is something already we, uh, we already discussed. Uh, these are denial of service attacks because you are compromising the usage of systems for the, the usage of the system by legitimate users. Okay, so here are uh, people that uh, wanted to legitimately interact with Thai with this bot were no longer able to do it, 
And again, people that were legitimately trying to use Google Maps in this case, they were no longer able to um, use it correctly, right? So that's a denial of service for legitimate users. In general, the problem of poisoning is, is the following. So assume that you have uh, a classical um, learning problem. You have training data with labels, uh, which can be, for instance, a collection of emails labeled as spam and uh, ham, so legitimate uh, emails. Then you extract features, you learn your classifier, and then you check the accuracy on the test set. So this is typically the design process of machine learning algorithms. And you see an example here. I train my filter, which learns weights for uh, words, and then you can correctly classify spam and ham emails. Now in the poisoning phase, what the attacker is doing is uh, injecting some poisoning data in the training set such that eventually the classifier learning process is compromised in a way that the error is now maximized on, on some clean test set. So in this case, the spam email, which was correctly classified before, is now misclassified as malicious. And uh, <clears throat> this, for instance, in this case, what you do is uh, you inject a spam email into the training process. And this spam email, so this email label, labeled as spam, contains good words. So if you repeat this process over and over, in the end, uh, emails that contain the um, legitimate words university and campus will probably be misclassified as malicious because now university and campus are learned as bad words by the filter. Okay, so that's the goal of a poisoning attack is to compromise the learning process such that um, clean test data is now misclassified. Uh, is that clear? At this point, because if if the notion is clear, then I can move on to <clears throat> define uh, the problem a bit more formally. And in particular, so th this is the goal that we have, right? To maximize the error on clean test data. And the attacker has the ability of injecting poisoning samples into the training set. So that's um, the setup. Now, let's we can just start by focusing you know on, on on an attacker that injects just one training point for which we fix the label so i just give you an example on a simple 2d case here so let's say you have this linear svm <clears throat> this is what you see here is a two-dimensional training set okay so the red and the blue points they are your training data and for this the classification error that you have for this classifier is 2%, okay? But remember that the classification error is measured on a separate test set. So it's not the error that I have on these points, but it's the error that I have on a separate set of points sampled from the same distribution, which here is just two Gaussians, okay? So that's the setup. This number is evaluated on a different bunch of points. Okay, then the question is where I should put my attack point to maximize this error. If you, for instance, if I add a red point over here, then you see that the boundary tilts a little bit in this direction to reduce the loss of this point, but this uh, increases the error on clean data by, four, by you know, roughly 2%. So here the error is now almost 4%. So this is just an example of what happens if as an attacker I add a point in this location. But the question here is that I don't, want to add you know a random point i just want to add the worst one so the the point that will maximize the classification error and then imagine that you do this process for all the points that you have and all the possible location in this space so i put xc here then here then here and so on and so forth and every time i add this point to the training set i retrain the classification algorithm and i measure the test error on a separate test um, data so if you do this repeatedly, you're going to get, you know, uh, the shape of your decision function. So this is, uh, sorry, the, the objective that you want to maximize. So basically what these plots tell you is, um, is if you add XC in this location, the error stays roughly 2%. And you see, if you add it in this region, the error never changes because essentially XC is learned as a reserve vector. So it's not really changing the decision boundary. If you start, if you add XE on this side, instead the error is, is increasing. And so the maximum is achieved roughly where you see this red area here, okay? 
So that's essentially our optimization program now. So we want to uh, understand, we want to find this point, xc, that maximizes the error. That, uh, so for which you have this value, um, this maximum value 0.6% uh, in this case, which would be down here. So that's the setup. Um, and this, of course, you cannot do it uh, as we did here because you cannot exhaustively search for this point in the space. You can do that for a 2D space, but not definitely if you have um, hundreds or thousands of dimensions. So we need something more efficient. But um, now this was just an example. Now we, we are ready to formalize the problem more generally. So what you want to do is, uh, is basically the following. So you want to maximize the, the error, so the loss function, on a clean set of data. So this is going to be the validation set here. But you want to do that by manipulating a training point. OK, so uh, within this uh, function here, uh, this function to be evaluated requires that you retrain the classifier on the training data plus the poisoning point. OK, because that's exactly the process. So W star will be your classifier which has learned also the poisoning data, and then you evaluate this classifier on the validation set to measure the error. So what you have here is called the bi-level problem because you have the outer objective here, and then you have a constraint, which is another optimization problem. So this is the learning process in, in the end. For, for example, this is learning the SVM with the poisoning point, okay? So this is called the bi-level problem because you have two nested, you have one outer optimization and a nested optimization problem. And of course, this is much more challenging to solve than the other one. Um, here you have an example for the SVM. So this is a concrete instance where you are maximizing the inch loss for those of you uh, who remember what the inch loss is, subject to the fact that uh, the SVM is trained also considering the poisoning point. OK, so you see that the only point in which you have X, C is this one, is in the inner optimization here, is in the nested learning problem. All right, so the question is now, uh, how can this be solved? <laughs> um, this is now, these bi-level problems are, are, are also used in many other uh, different areas of machine learning. So this, the same formulation that you have here, um, so this is essentially a stack, what is also called from game theory, a Stackelberg game, where you have a leader and a follower. So it's like a game where one player moves first and then the other one follows. It's not like a game where they play simultaneously. So this is like the formulation that you have from, from game theory, but um, it's the same problem you, you have if you uh, deal with meta learning or hyperparameter optimization. I'm not going to delve deeper into this. I, I'll just leave it, the keywords there if in case you want to, um, to know more. But meta learning is basically adapting one classifier to work well on different tasks. It's like a sort of uh, transfer learning in a sense. So you look for representations that work well in, on different tasks. And hyperparameter optimization helps you to define, for example, um, tune the hyperparameter of a model. To, to, to this end, you have to, again, uh, consider a, a bi-level problem. Like if you want, let's say you want to, to tune the parameter C of the SVM in an optimal way. This is how you can formulate it. And, and this time you maximize or you minimize with respect to C, but it's the same formulation in the end. So that's uh, hyperparameter optimization as well which is now used for, uh, you know, uh, tune something, some parameters of uh, neural nets, uh, like the learning rate or these kind of things. OK, so now the, the good news is that, in a sense, let's say you want to solve this by gradient descent. OK, so again, I want to compute the gradient of this loss with respect to the input training point, xc. So if you take the derivative of this, uh, this is the derivative of the outer function with respect to W. And then since this W star, basically it, it, it's a function, it's, a, it's an implicit function of XC, it implicitly depends on your training point, then you're going to have this uh, derivative here. Okay, so that's uh, using, just using the chain rule. Um, now, the, the, if you look at this function, this derivative here, this is very interesting because it's the function that tells you 
how the parameters of the classifier, so the weights of your neural net, for example, the optimal weights, change as soon as you modify X C, you modify a point in your training set. So that's the really the key question here. So the, the, the difficult part of this, of this task is understanding how the classification boundary changes when you shift the point into the, the training point, so the poisoning point in the input space. And this is like the real challenge with respect to adversarial examples, because when you optimize adversarial examples, the classifier is constant. When you optimize poisoning attacks, they are also changing the classification boundary. So that's why the formulation is much more complicated here. Uh, now, the good news is that despite gradient is not easy to compute, um, you, you can apply some tricks. Well, there is more than one actually, but the easiest one is that you can actually replace the learning problem with the equilibrium conditions, uh, which is basically a linear system of equations. And then you can compute the, the gradient in closed form. And this in practice amounts to inverting the set of equilibrium conditions. I'm not going to give uh, a detailed explanation of this, but this is how the gradient looks like, which is for the uh, RBF kernel here, or in general for kernelized um, supervector machines. And you see that it's much more complicated than before. And this part in particular here, there's a matrix inversion here. So here, what we are doing is inverting the Karun, uh, the karush kuntaker conditions. So the equilibrium conditions of your problem, of the, the optimum, to understand how we should shift the training point, the poisoning point, in a way that uh, preserves equilibrium of the solution um, while maximizing the outer loss. So that's uh, basically what, what's, uh, what this is telling us. And um, then if you implement this, of course, computing this gradient is much uh, more costly than in the other case. But what you see is that essentially it works. In principle, you can show it on some uh, small scale uh, experiments and, and some simple classifiers. Uh, we did that for the SVM, logistic regression, lasso ridge, and many other uh, convex models. Um, and you see that the attack uh, works fairly well in this case. So you take, in this case, we took a blue point, flip the label to red. So this is the label of the poisoning point, which is fixed in this case. And then we start optimizing the point by following the gradient. Um, and you see that the gradient climbs the, the objective function until it reaches the maximum here. Um, of course, if you start from uh, without flipping the label, the attack probably doesn't work because if, if I start from a red point here, this is a flat region where the gradient is zero. So I don't know where to go if I start from here. But instead, if I start from uh, you know deep inside a different class, then, I, then there is signal that I can follow to optimize my function. And then here you have another example for a nonlinear um, optimization problem. So the nonlinear um, uh, the RBF SVM. All right, so these are some experiments which I have to say they, they were quite surprisingly to us. Uh, what we did here was to consider a linear classifier trained on the MNIST. Okay, so this is a linear support vector machine trained on 100 points uh, where we have just two classes, zero and four. Those are the only two digits that we consider. The test set is about 2,000 points, and these are all clean. So we are not mod modifying anything. This is just zeros and fours uh, without modifications. Then what we do here is we take this image of uh, a four, and we label it as a zero. This is a training set image. Okay, so we are adding one additional point. So the training set would be 100 points plus this one. If you just take this four and label it as zero, so this is just a mislabeled sample, then you know if you see here, this is the first iteration. It's just <laughs> increasing the error, maybe less than one percent in this case. Okay, so the validation error. This is what I'm looking at. Um, then, if you optimize the perturbation as described in the previous uh, with the previous algorithm, then what you have is this blurred image. There is a fork here. There is a small shape of, uh, you know, the contour of a zero in the background. Now, if you label this single point as zero and you add it to the training set of your classifier, this will essentially screw up the learning process because now you have 30% error on your validation data, which is the loss, you know, in the outer part. 
but in, uh, if you if you do it on the test points, which are not are never used in the optimization process of, of your neither your classifier nor the attack, here you are you are we have more than 20% error with a single point, which to us it was quite surprising. Um, and then, of course, you can do uh, the same analysis by increasing the number of attack points. And what we did here is to optimize greedily one point at a time. And you see that I can raise the error almost to 30 percent in this case. OK, so this is more average or more points and so on. But again, by controlling less than 10 percent of the data points uh, in the training set, the attacker may be able basically to go from zero to 30 percent error on clean data, causing effectively a denial of service. Um, there are recent developments of this work, so we have recently shown that actually to poison linear classifiers, you may also use uh, some simpler heuristics. In this case, you, you feel free to have a look at this paper. Um, there have been uh, some attempts also to poison deep nets. The first one is this uh, beautiful paper by uh, Ko and others, I think from, uh, from Stanford University, and they uh, we're proposing a method to actually for explainability, okay, so to understand which are the most influential prototypes in your training set that contribute to some given decisions. But um, given that the math is the same, the mathematical uh, development was the same, they also showed that you can also craft attacks under this light against deep networks. And they basically use the same algorithm that uh, we developed in 2012 and 13 based on these KKT um, conditions um, to show that you can actually attack uh, a deep neural network. But we have to say that they use a very simple setting in which, similar to the ICAB uh, work, where you, froze, uh, all, you freeze all the network layers except the last one for which you have a linear classifier. So it's again exactly the same attack uh, because you are only changing the convex uh, linear layer that you have on top and all the rest is frozen. So basically you can compute the same gradient and then you uh, to bring the attack in the input space, you just chain the gradients to the remaining part, which is constant. So that's really um, a simple step beyond what we did before. And but still it's very interesting. And what they were able to show is that if you take this uh, image of a dog in your training set, and you label it as a fish. So there is this mislabeling also here. You craft this perturbation, as I said before, so following the same technique by multiplying also the gradient to uh, bring the, bring the uh, perturbation in the input space. Then you have basically the same image as before with this slight perturbation on top. And then if this, when this is learned by the network, all these images of dog that you see here, these five images, are misclassified as fishes with art with high confidence. So you see here that this is a fish, 97%, and so on and so forth. So the, remember these images, these are test images, they are clean. The only thing that is changed is one training point. Okay. That's just to give you an idea. But uh, I, I really recommend you to read this paper because it's uh, it's really insightful. All right, so we did also some attempt in uh, poisoning uh, neural nets going beyond um, only, you know, using the KKT conditions. Uh, I'm not giving you the detail of this because this is much more complicated than what we've been talking about so far. So this is going to be uh, a killer <laughs> talk at this point for you. But uh, if you're really interested in uh, mastering, let's say, by level optimization problems, playing with poisoning attacks or hyperparameter optimization or meta learning. Uh, these are really the five uh, milestones that you should look at. OK, so this is really the first paper by Donke, the Justin Donke. I think it's really, really insightful. Um, and, and then I really recommend you to read these ones if you want to understand how to scale these, uh, how to solve by level problems. Um, when you use very complicated classifiers like neural networks for which you don't even have exact equilibrium right because you train them for some iterations and then you stop uh, and this is really uh, for them you cannot just use the kkt conditions so you have to go beyond that and these are really recent papers on using automatic differentiations and tricks that help you scale these uh, 
solutions uh, for bilevel problems involving much more complex uh, deep, deep neural networks. Okay, uh, we also crafted very recently uh, another poisoning attack with a different goal. So instead of uh, maximizing just the classification error in an indiscriminate way, you can actually consider a problem where you have a minority group, okay? And then um, what you can do is inject uh, malicious training points that will make the classifier unfair in the end. So this is again another variant of a poisoning attack where the formulation is always the same. So you always have this bilevel problem, but the outer loss is no longer the you know, classification error. But in this case, you are trying to maximize a measure of uh, unfairness in a sense. So in this case, we were attacking the, the metric, a metric which is called disparate impact, um, and it's used in, in fairness. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to also have a look at this, uh, at this work. Um, I'm sure uh, we have also already discussed uh, the transferability properties of, of algorithms for, uh, sorry, of evasion attacks. And we had similar conclusions for, uh, for poisoning attacks as well, even though in this case, the correlations and um, with the metrics and the error prediction were a bit weaker, to be, to be frank, frankly speaking. But again, the main message here is that when you try to transfer poisoning attacks from one model to the other, their impact still depends on the vulnerability of the target model. So how much you know, the target is vulner vulnerable per se, and how much the models, uh, the surrogate and the target models are aligned in terms of their gradients. Because of course, if you're following the same path, uh, that, then they probably have uh, very similar decision functions. And so they, you can poison them in a, in a similar manner. Um, yep, I think I'm done with this part. If uh, there are no questions, I think we can make a short break, like uh, again, eight minutes, and then <clears throat> I leave the word to uh, my colleague, uh, Catherine, uh, for the final, uh, for the final uh, rush today. Okay. Are there any questions? Okay, I hope it was more or less all clear, um, but in case you have offline questions, just uh, send an email to me or uh, leave me a message on, on Teams. Okay, so let's have another break. 11.10, we start uh, again, and Catherine will cover the last part of, uh, of, of today's lecture. Thank you for following.
Hello, everyone. Um, so welcome back to the lecture on countering poisoning attacks. Um, I'm Katrin, and um, as Patissa just said, so I'm, I'm working with Batista. I'm his poster. Uh, I did my PhD in Germany at CISPA, uh, in case you're in research, you might have heard of that. It's a by now um, large institute that works in um, both AI, but mostly um, security. One quick question. So can everyone see the slides and can you also see my mouse cursor just in case I'm pointing at something? OK, thank you for the feedback. Uh, I just realized I can't really see the chat when I'm seeing the slides, so please feel free to unmute, unmute yourself when you have a question. Um, otherwise, I'll just reply at the end um, of the lecture. Um, so as I just said, so we're going to talk about um, countering poisoning attacks. So you've just learned what poisoning attacks are. So the natural question is, OK, how can we defend or mitigate them? And um, just to recap a little bit, so what we saw is that Poisoning in generally um, injects points that are far away from the training data because this is the best way to sort of mail the classifier and to learning a decision boundary um, that isn't implicated by the by the benign data. Um, and also before we start, another very important point that I need to emphasize here is that in contrast to evasion, where, which you've heard about um, this morning, um, defending poisoning um, might actually be possible. So in evasion, everything feels like a lot of hopeless because you can always attack again and attack again. But because of this outlying property um, of those samples, um, there is actually a chance that we might be able to, to understand these attacks and build defenses that actually work. And um, in the kind of poisoning that we are talking about now, um, there are mainly two different kinds of defenses. And we call these data sanitization defenses and robust optimization defenses. And the way they differ is that um, if you look at the training, so you have the data collected and then you have the training and then you do maybe some testing. Um, and the difference is that data sanitization takes essentially place before the algorithm is trained. So you take the data, you sanitize it, and then you plug it into your classifier. Robust optimization, on the other hand, um, is something that where you alter the classifier or you alter the training. So this is essentially the biggest uh, difference between the two. And to give you a slightly better understanding of what this difference might mean, um, we're going to see two examples of data sanitization defenses um, in this talk. And then we pass to robust optimization with the three examples here. Um, and then we will discuss a little bit beyond defenses. So um, but I said also earlier talked about adaptive attacks and evasion. Um, and we will understand a little bit more some trade-offs that exist in poisoning. Um, which is to say, actually, if we get to finish the lecture, so I will see um, how we are with the time. If not, we continue next week. OK, so let's uh, dive right in and let's discuss the defense, which is based on micro models. Um, just as a summary, so what is the setting that we are considering? Um, so the task is outlay detection. So you have network traffic analysis, you have the packages, and then you try to determine if an attack is taking place. Um, the algorithm that is used is sort of model agnostic. Um, but in general, outlier detection. And this is already um, a hint in the direction of dataset sanitization, because if you can plug in any model, then that is because you are sanitizing the data. The attack assumptions that are used in this work is that the attacker alters a small part of the data, which is a natural assumption poisoning, because if you change everything, I mean, it's like, well, what, what is the poison, right? So you don't know anymore. Um, and then the other attacker assumption is that you have either a persistent attack or a targeted attack. So these two different kinds um, of attacks. And um, a further detail is um, the assumption of an oracle, which has high accuracy, um, but also high computational costs. So this is an oracle that actually exists. And the reason that we are not using this directly um, on the data is that it is prohibitively expensive. Um, I think the attacker state in that paper that um, the increase um, in time is, I think, over a thousand percent if you use that. So it's almost perfect, but well, it's just too expensive to use it. Um, then let's dus discuss a little bit more about what traffic net network traffic data is. Um, so essentially, this describes the data packets that are sent around in, a, in any computer network. So it could be university, it could be company. 
um, theoretically it could be the internet, but that doesn't make um, well so much sense. Um, and the goal is, um, as I said earlier, to detect malicious things going on. So for example, um, a distributed DOS attack or a DOS attack to detect port scans or to detect, for example, worm outbreaks or any other malware that is sort of affecting and visible at this scale. And the problem we have is that real world network data is complex. So the main problem is um, that benign abnormalities might only occur a short amount of time and they are very infrequent. And there's a low ratio of born benign and malicious outliers. What does that mean? So if you think about this outlying training data point in poisoning, then what the summary tells you is essentially, okay, so you have this data and the data naturally has this kind of rare event. And we know that some of these are malicious and some of these could be an attacker and some of these could even be benign. So this is a very difficult um, setting. It's like the needle in the haystack um, where you have this very low frequency um, events, say. And um, the solution that the authors propose is to train micro models. So what you do is you take the training data, which is illustrated here with this blue bar, um, and they have a total of 500 hours of training data. And they test it and they say that intervals of three to five hours work well. And what you do is you take these intervals and then you train a model on them. And you can imagine this a little bit like this. So you take the training data and then you slice it so that you have um, just joint chunks. And on each of these, you train an outlier detection, which is symbolized here by AD. And uh, again, so this is model agnostic. You can plug in any technique that you would like to use. And the intuition of the defense is as follows. So suppose that we have these two um, points of time which are affected by an attacker. And then if you chunk the data this way, then in this case, you would have, for example, two chunks which are affected. Um, and then if you do a smart combina combination of these models, um, then naturally, if we go back here, we see that the vast majority of models is not going to be affected by the malicious data. And then if you do the combination smart, you will see this output and like the, the, like the clean output will prevail. That's the idea behind this defense. Um, and the math behind this is um, this output, which is LIG, is the output on a classifier of a particular time frame and um, the, pa the package that you're testing for, for sanitization, which is J. And then you can add some weight to actually um, improve the, the accuracy of this, um, of this kind of classifier, say, um, where the most trivial solution, obviously, is that everything is weighted equal. Um, and then what you can further do is you can also set a threshold. So how many classifiers do you assume can be affected before um, it, it doesn't work accurately anymore? So in our case, um, if we go back again, so we have um, eight classifiers in total, two are affected. So if we set a threshold of three, say, figuratively here, um, then the model would still work despite the attack. Whereas if you set the threshold at one, which would be too low, it might be affected. So, um, and then the idea is after this cleansing process, so you build these models, you use them to essentially test further data, and this data is then assumed to be clean, and then we can train an outlier detection on this clean data. And um, what they do in their evaluation is they plug in two existing anomaly sensors. Um, one is this um, A sensor, and the other one is P, so these are like existing works. Um, and what we see is when we sanitize them, the true positive rate is a lot higher and the false positive rate um, in these cases also a little bit higher, but it's still acceptable. Um, and they tested this on three data sets. So overall, we can say, okay, so this is an intuitive idea and it seems to work in practice. And um, what is very interesting is naturally the question would be, is there an adaptive attack for this? Um, and this may be straightforward solution if you work a long time in this and you look at the concept is, well, okay, but I can just poison every model, right? And then it doesn't matter how much you use because they, they are all essentially returning crap. And what they do is they show, okay, so this actually, this kind of attack works. Um, because again, if you poison all the micro models, then well, the whole system doesn't work anymore. But they also propose a solution for this kind of attack. Um, and the idea is to say, okay, so suppose that we have different sites or different companies, um, then what we could do is we could compare the models across these different sites. And um, the way you can imagine this as a high, at a high level is as follows. Um, so you have two sites, 
So you have the, the previous side and we see that almost all models are poisoned. And then we have another side and for some reason, maybe there's another attack, but for the sake of this um, explanation, only two models have been affected. And what we now do is we say, okay, so we don't really care um, about the clean models of the site, but what we're actually going to do is we take the, the models that we figured out by this process are actually um, a sort of um, broken. Um, and these we compare with the other model from the other side. Um, where this sort of model comparison is rather high level because there's different ways how to implement that and it's um, or at least at the point where the paper was written it's also open research how to determine that. And um, what we do when we run this comparison is you see that there's a large fraction of models which are maybe broken in a similar fashion and then we know that we shouldn't be using these models and we actually obtain a new model which is only contain uh, which contains new models which are clean. And um, in this way, we can actually deal also with an attack where everything, um, where all the models got poisoned. Um, and what we see here is the detection rate remains high because this is what usually goes down, that um, not all things are detected. Um, and the false positive rate is still um, fairly low. Okay, so to summarize this defense, um, so, Again, high level defense, you split the data into different chunks, train a micro model on each chunk, and then you combine this kind of micro models to cleanse the data. And um, what is very nice here is that they use knowledge from the application. Um, and I mean with this, and, and on the one hand, that this is time data. So it's very easy to like say, okay, I'm testing on a month, for example. So there's a very intuitive split here. Um, if you compare this to, to vision, for example, right? Like you could do split across classes, but it's not as intuitive as here. Um, and what is also a very good point about this paper is that they test adaptive attacks. And that's something you've talked about earlier, and it's something very important that we're also going to talk about later. Um, and um, what is also important that if you test an adaptive attack and you find one that works, if there is an extension as it is here to alter your defense to encompass that attack, you should definitely do it. I mean, if there isn't, then that, that is a different problem. But if there is a very good way, you should you should always try to do that. Okay, so that was already um, the first data sanitization defense. So now we're going to see a different defense, which is also doing data sanitization, which is called reject on negative impact or RONI. Again, let's talk about the setting we are in. So this time, um, the task we're trying to solve is spam classification. So you have spam emails, you have ham emails, good and bad, and then you try to determine for a new incoming mail whether it is spam or ham. And um, the algorithm that the authors use is the naive bias classifier. And the assumptions made concerning the attack is that attackers' emails are always classified as spam, never as ham. So whatever the attacker sends will be classified as spam. Um, and that the attacker can only modify the, bottle of the, uh, the body of the mail, but not the header. So um, as I said, um, the authors use as a classifier naive bias. Um, I guess you've heard um, about bias theorem when you heard that, so this classifier is directly derived from that. So in, on a very high level summary, what bias theorem does, it, it tells you sort of how to um, translate conditional probabilities into each other. And this is very helpful in machine learning when you have data and labels and you want to predict the labels from the data. In practice, what you do, uh, in particular in this case, is you count and then you use the counts as probabilities. Um, and this is called knife bias because um, it has, well, you have this like assumption of independence in the features. Um, and well, it's also a very straightforward way how to deal with that. So we compute the probabilities based on these word counts of ham and spam emails. Um, and the nice thing is that this actually returns your probability between zero and one. And what you can do then is you can set a threshold to have this area of insecurity. You certainly um, know this when you have your own email program that sometimes or some of the programs actually show you an email and they say, I think this is spam, but I'm not sure. So this is um, what you can do if you set this kind of threshold. And um, so now more on the defense strategy. Um, so as I said, the idea is reject on negative impact or RONI. Um, and what they do is they have a training set of 20 emails and then they have very large validation set. And what they do is they take the training 
uh, the training data set, and then they take each email or one email from the validation set, add it to the training data, and then observe the outcome. So is it getting better or worse? Um, so I'm trying to illustrate this here. So you have the training data, you have the evaluation data, and then you sort of compute the accuracy on the training data plus this chunk, and then you repeat that for different chunks. Um, and as you see here, where I made up these numbers to make the point, um, is that maybe if you add one of those emails, the accuracy is going to be vastly different. And this might be a hint that this email has been tampered with, because it seems to interfere very strongly with the classifier, um, which is what poisonous points usually do. Um, and indeed, um, the um, authors report um, that the average change in the classifier um, or in accuracy um, is very large. So there is a 50% decrease in true positives. Um, and um, this means that the data is separable. So you can actually run um, the training for all these individual emails. Um, and then you can figure out which ones are the poisoning ones because their effect is so strong. Um, an additional comment here um, from the authors is also that training on a lot of spam actually also changes the thresholds um, because the spam gets sort of more um, gets more into the insecure zone. So you might want to adapt the thresholds, but this is just a side note. Um, and the experiments they reported um, here is on uh, a 10,000 inbox training set, which is 50% spam. Um, and as I um, as I said, so it correctly identifies the ham, um, but the spam is not correctly classified as spam because it is more classified as enter. Um, and this is also what we what we see here um, in this plot. So we see the black line, no defense, um, as being like as the authors control more percent of the training data set, um, the accuracy naturally decreases of the classifier unless the defense is deployed. Um, and what we see here as well is like that also the choice of the thresholds um, affects um, how well the, the defense performs, which is intuitive, right? Because um, you're essentially um, given the threshold, you're accepting in, in this case the upper 5%, and in this case the upper 10 percent or upper 10 accuracy points, um, a probability range. Um, and this means that when this range gets larger, then there's naturally more emails classified as this. So, um, but yes, you, you see there's a large difference here um, in terms of um, misclassified emails. So the defense um, seems to work well in, in practice. So takeaways, um, again, so the idea here is um, to train the model on the original or on a clean training data set and an individual point and then observe the difference. And this is a very intuitive approach, as I said, because if you assume a poisonous point to have a huge impact, you're going to see this here. Um, and there's two sort of drawbacks of this. Like the first one is this obviously doesn't scale. So you can do this on spam emails. Um, you can actually see the paper is rather old. But nowadays, say, if you think about ImageNet uh, and thousands of images, then this isn't really something that you would like to do. Um, and the next um, drawback is, um, which I didn't really focus on in this talk, but I want to uh, just remark it, is that they add a whole dictionary in every attack. So the impact of each poisoning point is huge. Um, it is not clear if you just have a subtle change if this, was, if this would actually work. Um, and something else that I think is, is a very good point of this defense is if you think about, so we have this training part, but we also talk a little bit about the threshold. And when you change the threshold, you could reason that you also change the algorithm. And then you could reason, okay, this is not only data sanitization, but isn't this a little bit also of robust optimization or robust training? Um, and in this case, we can clearly say, well, no, because we are not really optimizing this kind of threshold. But what I want to point out is that the, the sort of boundary between those two things isn't necessarily clear because technically you can do both things at the same time. So um, just keep that in mind that although there is this categorization, not all works might necessarily fit in it. Okay, then um, let's talk about robust optimization and robust training. Um, the first approach we're going to talk about is begging. And um, again, the task here is spam classification. Um, technically, the paper also 
contains experiments on intrusion detection, which are going to skip here. Um, the algorithm we're going to use is bagging or weighted bagging. And um, the attacker assumptions are um, that the attacker again controls um, a subset of the samples and also that the attacker is able to change features. So you could also think about an attacker that only changes labels, but in this case, um, um, the attacker changes the features. Um, so as I'm not sure if all of uh, you have heard begging, I'll just give you a very high level idea of what begging is. Um, and the idea is that if you have a classifier that exhibits a large variance uh, in terms of the um, output, so like if the classifier changes a lot, if you change the data slightly, um, then your classifier exhibits high variance. And then um, begging is something that is very fruitful to do. Because what you do is you essentially you subsample the data set and then you train classifiers on each subsample data set. And because they are slightly different, the classifiers are going to be slightly different. Um, but because they exhibit high variance, they're going to be a little bit more than slightly different. And then this ensemble performs actually better than a classifier that is just trained on one of the data sets. And um, if you think about the subsampling and you think about poisoning points and about an attacker that controls a small fraction of points, then I think it's somewhat intuitive why this could be a good offense, because if you're subsampling the data, maybe you're not always catching all the poisoning points because they are rare. And then you would expect this ensemble to be a little bit more robust towards poisoning. In this case, um, the author suggests to use weighted, bag weighted bagging. So this is a bagging where you do a density estimation of the data. So where are there a lot of data sets, uh, data points in um, in feature space and where is less? Um, and then you sample according to this density. So what you can, uh, the way you can imagine this is where well, you have this density and then you sample those data sets where you sample, where you're more likely to sample points from high density areas than from low density areas. And this essentially amplifies the effect that I just said, because poisoning points to have a huge impact will rather be in low density areas. Um, in this sense, um, we can expect this resampled data set to have um, less poisoning points, even less poisoning points than we would normally resample. And um, they report the experiments on spam um, using the so-called track corpus, um, which has a huge number of legitimate and spam emails. Um, and um, the data set has roughly um, 20,000 features. And what we see here in this plot is where um, above um, is better. So this is um, AUG, so area under the curve. Um, it's hopefully something that you have heard of. Um, it serves to measure the goodness of a classifier based on some parameter. When it's 1, it's good. When it's 0 0.5, it's essentially random guess. If it's negative and it's binary, you can actually just flip it, and then 0 is equivalent to 1. Um, and what we see here um, essentially is that um, the, um, the weighted begging up here is um, the hatched lines. It performs best um, given that we increase the poison, the amount of poisoning points. Um, although essentially here, if you have too many poisoning points, at some point the density becomes so high that it becomes hard to distinguish um, if it's like some benign features here or if it's some poisoning. Um, if you don't know the ground truth. Um, and we see that begging is also slightly better than the standard, but um, weighted begging outperforms this. So the takeaways um, from this defense is that um, if you think about the previous defense, um, we also did some sort of subsampling of the data, but we did it some systematically. So we would always use one email. And what we see here, um, because this is essentially the difference between begging and weighted begging is that a random split already is helpful. Um, but if you do weighted begging, this is even better because you're adding this information about what could be poisoning a uh, poisonous and what could not be poisonous. Um, but this is also at the same time a sort of disadvantage because it depends on the kernel density estimation. And technically an adaptive attack here would be to um, insert a point that is highly poisonous, but is added at a high density area by the density estimation. Um, so this is so there is this really important component now. Um, and um, the other parameter that we saw implicitly in the previous plot is that it like the success of the defense also depends on how many begging classifiers we use, um, where more is better. 
Um, so we have this parameter that we need to tune as well. So um, let's talk about um, a PCA defense. Um, I hope you've heard about um, PCA. It's, it's a fairly standard technique. Um, but again, let's first consider the setting. So the task is again anomaly detection and backbone networks. So it's network traffic that we try um, where we try to find anomalies. The algorithm, as I said, is PCA. And the attack assumptions this time is again that the attacker controls a subset of the samples. Um, and in this specific setting of network traffic, we assume that the attacker can only add traffic. It cannot remove traffic and it cannot delay traffic. Um, and this I would say is a reasonable assumption in this context because how like how would you remove traffic unless unplugging something, which would be fairly obvious for whoever owns the network. Um, and for the details um, is that they study a wide range of attack in the paper concerning white box, black box, and also boiling frog, where over a long time you're slowly increasing um, the amount of introduced data. Um, so as I said, I hope you've heard about PCA. Um, if you hadn't, it's a really basic um, technique, uh, which is really util to know. So when you don't know, I will just um, summarize a little bit what it does. Um, so in PCA, what you do is you take the data and then you compute the principal components. Um, this is visualized here for two-dimensional data, where the principal components are the directions in which the data has the most spread. Um, there is like I will use like a very high level um, explanation for this using the mean and the variance. So when the variance is larger than that's your principal component. Um, and when you think about mean and variance, um, then I think if you have a little bit of background in statistics, what you know is that both mean and variance are super vulnerable to outliers, uh, just simply because of the formulation, right? So if I put a, a point like here outside this plot, say, um, this mean is going to be shifted. Um, and what they do in this paper is essentially they say, well, we can do PCA, but we can change PCA to be less vulnerable to outliers. And um, one straightforward way to do this is to use not the mean, but the median absolute deviation, which is based on the median. Um, and then if you think about how the median is computed, uh, I think we, we know that it is less prone to outliers. Um, and um, they give an example of this um, where in red, is um, standard PCA. We see there's a lot of points inserted here. Um, and in blue is the algorithms that they propose, which is essentially um, replacing parts of the algorithm by, um, by techniques which are less um, vulnerable to outliers, so which are more robust. And um, so now they apply this in practice. And the idea behind this is that you take um, the network traffic and you, you use PCA to, to represent it, and then you liquid the residuals. Um, so just on a very high level, um, residuals are the errors that you usually have when you fit a function. In this case, it's a linear um, plot where you have those, those errors. And um, on a very high level and, and a very, very general, what you can say is, okay, small residuals means that the model is fitted well, which might indicate usual data, and large residuals um, imply that the data does not fit well. Um, and I'm adding this remark here, or the variance in data is large, because there might be other reasons why this is the case. But in this particular case we're talking about, um, the idea is that if there is larger um, residuals, this implies an unusual event because it isn't fit well, it isn't represented well in the model already. And um, so what they report is, okay, so this is the distribution of the size of residuals. Um, and then what the approach essentially does is they define a cutoff threshold and whatever has a residual higher than this cutoff um, is considered um, an outlier and potential um, malicious activity. And what they also report is that by their new algorithm, this distribution becomes more heavy tailed and they need to change the threshold. Um, in this case, they are not using the previous um, cutoff, but they're using a Laplace cutoff. So Laplace is this distribution which has the very heavy tails. So it's very well suited in this case. And um, the approach is then evaluated um, on a six month period uh, from March 1st until September 10th, uh, 2004. Um, and um, what we see is that for um, each week of data, we have roughly 2,000 measurements um, and 144 networks. 
And what we see very nicely here um, is so um, we have here the, the evasion success. Um, and usually, I just realized, sorry, this error is the wrong, wrong direction. Um, so what we see here is that generally um, when there is an attack, so for example, here we have um, this kind of grow right and, and chaff or inserted uh, poisoning points, is that it goes up and there is some kind of um, evasion success, um, but it usually decreases over time. So um, initially, this is not captured by the model, but as soon as there is enough chaff there, um, it will be detected. Um, and this is also represented in another um, experiment where we have, again, this um, area under the curve, which I explained earlier. Um, so the perfect classifier is up here in this corner. And this line here is the random guess that we have. So the, the closer we are to that corner, the better it is. Um, and what we see is that the fixed classifiers, um, even with like 10% chef, as in this case, um, is... Um, um, so the, the corrected um, well-working method is almost as good as the original method on the clean data, which is an important baseline. Um, because like as you see, there's a slight decrease in accuracy and sometimes defenses decrease accuracy a lot. So takeaways um, from these algorithms are um, that sometimes when you have a method like, like PCA in this case, you can have a look at how the method works and you might be able to replace some components in the sense, although this is more complex than just exchanging a component, but you can look at what components you have in your algorithm and you might um, replace them or use a measure that is more robust to outliers, for example. Um, and this also hints towards something um, that is that there is already a field of robust statistics in machine learning. And many of the problems that we are discussing here have more or less a solution already in ML in the sense that um, these are not really made for an active attacker. So they are not made for someone circumventing the system, but there are cases of, of worst case changes, um, which are important to understand, which is why there is some work there already. And it's important to not lose track of this kind of work. All right, so um, let us talk about trim. Um, which is another defense. Um, and the task in this case is, um, there are three tasks actually, it's um, loan, healthcare, and house price data. Um, and the algorithm is a linear regression. So these are just three data sets to show that this linear regression um, can be applied and can be poisoned. Um, and attack assumptions, as before, are that the attacker controls a subset of the samples and that the attacker in this case can change both the features and the labels. So um, let us look at the optimization problem that we solve. So if you think, of, um, if you go a step back right now and remember that I showed you this line with the residuals, then what regression essentially does, it tries to minimize these residuals. And this is the mathematical formulation which you have when you actually formalize this in mathematical terms. So what you have here is essentially just empirical risk minimization. So you're having the squared loss and um, you're computing the, the mean over the squared loss. And then here you also have a regularization parameter. So this is just normal um, optimization. And now the, the question is, okay, so where does defense come in? And this is actually the part where the defense comes in. So um, this is, um, or the idea is that you do not only optimize the model, but you also optimize the points you train on. So they are implicitly embedded into this optimization problem. Um, and well, such a thing is difficult to solve. So what the authors propose is to solve this iteratively um, and they show empirically that it converges. Um, and because this is very mathy, um, we're gonna have a high level, um, I'm gonna show you the high level intuition right now. So before trim, you see this is the fitted data and you clearly see the benign data sort of in the middle and then you see the poisoning points with a circle around them scattered all over and you see how much they tilted the regression line. And what happens or the idea of trim is essentially to learn which points have a large residual and then to ignore them. And that is what you see here in the first iteration um, where the red points and the blue points the difference is that there's always a fraction of points which are left out by trim randomly um, to sort of uh, 
speed up the, the, the algorithm. And this is what you see here color wise. Um, but essentially what you see is that with each iteration, it is going a little bit more towards the benign data as it learns that, that these guys have a large, large residual and they are most likely to be outliers or to be poisonous points. So um, concerning the evaluation, um, in this case, in the plots, lower is better. And then we have a comparison with no defense and three other defenses. Brony was the one that we discussed earlier, if you remember. Um, and what we see is that as the poisoning rate increases, um, also the error increases, which is naturally because you're controlling more part of the data. Um, and um, they tested this on three different data sets. And what you see very nicely is that trim here in yellow is generally performing best. Um, it's not the case, funny enough, that no defense always performs worse. Um, but we do see that um, here, for example, um, the defenses do make a difference. But again, um, talking about trim, this idea to learn um, which points are the outliers is actually, so we see that it is working well. Um, okay, so let us summarize this. Um, so in this case, and this is a very, very good example um, for this robust training um, class that, that I explained to you earlier, the outlier detection is directly incorporated into the optimization problem. So we literally changed the optimization to encompass this outlier idea, which is generally poisoning points. Um, and then something good about um, the, the paper in general is that you compare to related work. This is always very helpful um, because it helps to put everything into context. Um, and natural limitation of this work is that the amount of introduced poisoning samples must be limited trivially because you're learning a subset of the points and as soon as you're having more poisoning points than um, the points you are ignoring, you will not be able to ignore our poisoning points. Okay, um, let me see. Okay, I um, think it's easiest to try to finish this. Um, okay, so let's talk about regularization and poisoning. Um, something that I have been mentioning earlier is that there's already solutions for some of these problems. Um, and if you think about um, limiting the impact of a single point or of a couple of outliers on the whole classifier, then something that might um, come to your mind when you have studied uh, machine learning for a longer time is to use regularization, because regularization um, sort of constrains your classifier and it prevents you from giving too much um, weight to, to a single point, for example, or a single feature for that matter. And um, what um, the authors do on this paper is they run a hyperparameter search for the hyperparameter that um, controls regularization. Um, and they also control the weights because if you think about the weights, if the weights are overall small, um, the classifier is sort of more regularized. Um, and if but the weights are large, very simplified, then it is less regularized. And um, what we see here very nicely is like the classifier, if it's not, um, if it's just using the hyperparameters used on clean data, um, the test error is going to increase very drastically as we include, uh, as we increase the fraction of poisoning points. Whereas if we learn it dy dynamically, um, the test error is going to be lower because the, like the hyperparameter search will sort of uncover that there is some form of outlier and then the impact that these outliers have on the algorithm is going to be limited. Um, so what we can conclude from this is that the effect of poisoning can be at least a little bit alleviated if we choose proper hyperparameters, for example, in regularization. Um, and this is uh, another plot which resulted from this experiment and what you see um, as um, the fraction of poisoning points increases and we are adaptively learning as a regularization parameter, then this regularization parameter increases as we add more poisoning points and the overall size of the weights decreases. Um, so this is essentially just another representation of what I just said, um, which is that if you use regularization or you can use regularization to tackle poisoning, what will happen is that you have to regularize the classifier more if there are more poisoning points. So to conclude this kind of relationship, um, regularization affects how the classifier learns data, and this includes poisoning points. 
Um, and there is this very nice relationship between complexity and poison vulnerability, which is implied here, um, which is that a flexible classifier, so an unconstrained classifier, a very um, adaptive classifier like a neural network, for example, is able to learn a poison faster. And a less flexible classifier or a classifier that's very much constrained or regularized learns a poison slower in the sense that you will need more points to get the same effect on the classifier. Um, and again, um, so this is a very typical example for how there's already a solution from machine learning, um, which can be used in this case to alleviate the problem. Okay, cool. Um, then let us conclude with adaptive attacks on poisoning. Um, so we have been talked a little, we have been talking already a little bit about um, how we should evaluate um, defenses. Um, and one very important um, factor here is how um, how to attack them because you can trivially use the attack that you use like that you were targeting at first, but then um, as Batista earlier said, so for the gradient-based attack, so maybe you just destroy the gradient and then it's just the attack that is broken and not the defense that is working. So this is something that we try to tackle in um, adaptive attacks. Um, and something in general that is very important is also to understand the parameters very well that, is, that are in your defense. So do ablation studies on the parameters and also state assumptions and threat model clearly because it allows you or it allows others to evaluate the defense properly and not because for, technically you can break any defense if you model it outside, if you test it outside the threat model, but then it isn't properly broken, right? So always state this clearly when you um, propose a defense. Um, and then as I said, the most important part is to actually consider adaptive attacks. So look at your defense and think about how you would need to design an attack that would essentially exactly circumvent the defense that you've designed. So um, there's this one paper, they actually introduced several attacks and we're going to fo be focusing on one here. Um, and they consider da data sanitization based defenses. So if you think about the first block, you do something with the data you sanitize and then you train your classifier. Um, and they, um, so we in particular are going to discuss two of these. Um, one is an outlier detector that rejects um, anything outside NL2 radius, so you can take the mean of the data and then you define a threshold in terms of an L2 distance. Um, and the other one exclude points which large loss, um, which is super similar to the one with the regression trim that we just discussed. Um, although in this paper, they are not particularly using trim itself. Um, and the assumptions they have is that the defense is applied without human intervention. This is a very important um, assumption because in a lot of cases you would say, yeah, but if I look at that, I would see it that the point is different. Um, but this doesn't really scale because the reason why we use ML is because we don't want people to look at that um, and we don't want people to solve this task. So this is a very um, valid remark here. And they further assume that the attacker can add between three, uh, can add um, less or equal to 3% of the data and remove up to 5%. Um, and um, this is the basic minimax attack that you um, just actually, that Batista discussed with you. Um, it might look a little bit different because um, they use a different formalization, um, but what it essentially does is it solves a settle point problem um, where you try to maximize, uh, the attacker tries to maximize the loss of the classifier test time and the defender tries to minimize the loss um, at training time. Um, and then, well, again, so you've discussed it before, if um, the classifier that you plug in is convex, then the, um, the, the whole problem is convex as well. And a problem with this attack is that, um, and this is something that you also see in, in the plots if you think about that, um, is that it will lead to, to points that have a very high loss. Um, and the other problem you have is, at least in the attack that is analyzed here, um, is that this usually is approximated because it's a bi-level problem, it's difficult to solve. Um, and if your assumptions are not quite right, um, you cannot be sure that your approximated test loss is actually hold in practice. And 
the idea in particular for the second point with the high loss, because this high loss, um, if you think about trim, is able to defend against such points, um, is to add a constraint um, which sort of forces the optimization to upper bound the loss that a point can have. Um, and um, yeah, so this limits that, and then that limits at, at the same time the ability of a defense to detect this kind of point. And what we see here is we have five defenses. Um, again, we are focusing on this L2 defense and on the loss defense, so on the blue and the red one. And what we see with this decoy parameter, so this improvement to the attack, is that um, the loss defense will be very effective against this attack unless it is adaptive. And this is exactly the point why we say that you need to like, um, study adaptive attacks, because if you look at this plot, you might think that the loss defense is the only one that is working or is the one that is working better. But what happens is that the attack is just very suitable for this defense. And if you use an adaptive attack, the defense will be as bad as the other defenses. And um, so this is another plot where you see again um, also that naturally as you increase the amount of fraction of poisoning um, points, um, then the test error will increase for both defenses. Another way um, to introduce um, perturbation constraints more directly um, is to say, OK, I limit the space where I can search. Um, this is similar to this um, L2 ball defense that I said earlier. So you know, assume that there is this ball around each point. You see this here. This is the, the corner of, of the distance of the feasible space. Um, and now what you say is, OK, optimize your point, or I optimize my point, but I have to stay in this feasible region. Um, and this again tackles the idea that points that are far away are super easy to detect because they're very, very different from the benign data. And um, again, what you see here is before and after. Um, so in the original data, the red part here, um, which is the outlier scores, is a lot like or in general larger than for benign data. And you see that once um, you have um, adapted the attack, the outlier scores are going to be somewhere in the middle of the benign data. So it's a, it's a lot harder now to detect this kind of point. Um, so it is really important to consider adaptive attacks because only with an adaptive attack you can know um, if your defense is sort of an illusion or if it's actually a defense that works. Um, and the difficult part is always to know if your adaptive attack was appropriate um, or not. Like say you're doing an adaptive attack and you perform, your defense still performs well. And the question is, okay, so is my defense now really good or is my adaptive attack just really crappy? Okay, so takeaways here, um, again, so the evaluation on adaptive attack when you propose a defense is absolutely necessary. So it doesn't make sense to propose a defense without an adaptive attack. And the other high level insight that we have if we look at those uh, um, at these two studies or these two adaptive attacks is that you can have an attacking point which is very far away from the data. It has a very large loss, which means it's very effective, but that also means it's very easy to detect. On the other side, um, you can have a point that is very hard to detect because it has lower loss um, and then it has less impact. And this is something, it's, it's a very nice trade-off that we have um, in this kind of, um, well, in, in this kind of area of poisoning defenses. So um, let me conclude this lecture. Um, and frankly, let me be bold here. Feel free to forget anything else, but please keep in mind these four things that I'm gonna tell you now. So as a story, in contrast to evasion attacks, there's actually a hope in poisoning that we are able to defend this eventually, once we understand it enough, once we understand all the trade-offs. And there are roughly two groups, or there's two ways how to do um, defenses against poisoning attacks. One is data sanitization, which means that you take the data, you figure out what is the malicious part, and you keep the good part. And the other one is robust optimization. So you alter the training, you use maybe robust optimization, um, and this makes your classifier itself more robust. Obviously, you can combine the two as well. And then um, we have seen two important trade-offs in poisoning. So one was this idea of having 
either a few strongly changed points, which have a huge impact, but which are easy detectable, or on the other end of the extreme, we can have few points, which are very hard to detect because they are exhibiting small loss. Um, but yeah, they will, be, they will be hard to detect, but you will also need more as an attacker. And the other trade-off that is important to remember is that a flexible classifier learns poisoning points um, faster, whereas if you apply regularization or a less flexible classifier, then um, the classifier will not be um, so vulnerable to, um, to poisoning. Okay, yeah, so that was it from my side. Um, I'm sorry, because it's already 12. Um, if you still have questions, um, I um, obviously, so I still have some time um, to, to answer them. So let me know. Um, so let me know if there are any questions, please. Okay, so I'm not seeing or hearing any questions now. Um, so in this sense, I would um, wish you um, a good weekend and you're always free um, to just write to us in case you have questions. Uh, Batista, are you here? Do you want to say something as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. <laughs> thanks, thanks, Catherine, for, uh, for covering the defenses on poisoning. I, I think, so the, the students replied that it's all clear. I hope so. Ah, okay, uh, awesome. Uh, in case there are questions, I can redirect questions to you in uh, in case I got some offline. Of course. All right. Thanks, everybody. So um, seeing, uh, looking forward to seeing you again on uh, next Wednesday. Bye bye. Have a nice weekend. Bye.